I've been particularly interested in Jean-Michel Basquiat's depiction of the police. It's not a subject specifically tackled by many mainstream artists, though I did make a video on Kent Monkman's depiction of the RCMP. I also made a video on Basquiat's defacement, a tribute to Michael Stewart, a black man murdered by two policemen in 1983. Though defacement is Basquiat's most recognized piece on the police, there's also been others, notably La Hara. A skeleton-like policeman faces us. He's assumed to be one of the few white men Basquiat portrayed, the whiteness of his bones perhaps referring to the whiteness of his skin. However, what's really striking in La Hara is the bloodshot eyes of the angered cop. He's depicted as a clownish monstrosity. However, irony of black policemen is, at least to me, the most salient critique of the police painted by Basquiat. The difference between the white and the black policemen painted in the same year is quite apparent. You can see what appears to be the white cop's bones and his expression is genuinely angry. As for the black cop, he's dressed from head to toe in a navy blue uniform and it's been often said that his face resembles a mask. The reason why Irony of Black Policemen is a stronger critique of the police than La Hara is because here, Basquiat isn't targeting the individual policeman, he's targeting a system. In my last stream, someone suggested I do a video on Basquiat, so I did. After every video now, I'll be streaming on YouTube to talk about the latest video, its subject, I'll have guests on, and we can just hang out. Also, if you enjoy this type of content, please check out patreon.com forward slash the canvas. It helps out a lot. Thank you. A pawn is the smallest and most expendable chess piece. Why is Basquiat calling this policeman a pawn. Why does he find it ironic that a black man would be a police officer? The answers to these questions are quite easy to find, they aren't that complicated, yet they are at the core of Basquiat's painting. It's ironic that a black man would be a policeman because the police as an institution in the United States is inherently and functionally working for the subjugation of black people. The irony of a black policeman is that he's working for and contributing to the oppression of his own people, his own family, his own self. I could leave it at that. Basquiat is criticizing the police not for the individual actions of individual cops, but for its function as a system within a larger system of white domination. The police works for the white dominated establishment and, therefore, the irony of a black policeman lies in the fact that he's protecting his oppressors. However, in order to best appreciate this work of art and engage with its ideas to the fullest, I'd love to explore the phenomenon of the black policeman with more depth and nuance. That's, after all, the whole point of this painting, to make us think about the implications of a black policeman. And to explore this topic, I interviewed former public defender and now Yale University professor, James Foreman Jr. In 2017, he published a book which earned him a Pulitzer Prize, Locking Up Our Own, Crime and Punishment in Black America. In this work, Foreman Jr. describes the history and the role black leaders played in adopting the policies that shaped America's criminal justice system today. He recounts in his introduction that as he worked as a public defender, he noticed that many of the black kids he defended were arrested, tried, and incarcerated by black people. 38% of America's prison population, which is by the way the highest in the world, is black. I think a good way to introduce James Foreman Jr. is through this photo of his father who was seen arrested during a civil rights protest in the 60s. No, you know, when I, when I was 
thinking about the book and even thinking more recently about, you know, what happened in Memphis with the officers and, and Mr. Nichols and people say, you know, people are surprised that there's these black officers. I really often think of a picture that we have up in my house of my father being arrested. So he's, it's 1964. Jim Crow is still the law throughout um, much of the Southern United States. Uh, he's in Atlanta. He's the executive secretary of an organization called the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which was one of the big civil rights organizations in the U.S. in the 60s. And it was the one, as the, stu as the name suggests, that was led by students and had sort of a lot of young people, a lot of energy. In some ways, you could sort of the most one of the more more radical or more confrontational um, of the of the civil rights groups. It's not just the sheriff of this county or the mayor or the police commissioner or George Wallace. This problem goes to the very bottom of the United States. And you know, I said it today, and I will say it again. If we can't sit at the table, let's knock the fucking legs off. Excuse me. <laughs> And their headquarters was was Atlanta, which had somewhat less intense kind of over, you know, uh, segregation and racism as some other parts of the South, but still had plenty of it and still had, you know, segregated eating areas and segregated restrooms and um, and segregated bathrooms and the like. Um, and so he was protesting uh, segregation and. He's being arrested, as you can see in the image, by a group of officers, including, you know, a bunch of black cops. And when I think about that picture, I often think about another picture, which is from about 15 years earlier. And it's when the first eight officers are black officers are sworn into the Atlanta police force. So the original movement to hire a black officer was successful, right? You can see it from the time from my dad's arrest um, because by then they have enough officers to arrest him. But in 19, but, but that first group of eight um, there was, it was a citywide celebration. You know, the mayor came and said to them, do for policing what Jackie did for baseball, referring to Jackie Robinson. Um, and so it's like you have these, moments you have martin luther king marching for one black officer then you have eight black officers and a citywide celebration and then you have i'm not the culmination but another step and my dad is protesting segregation and these officers are arresting them and i often think how much i would love to interview those officers and find out like you know Again, this goes to your the conversation about Basquiat and and Memphis, but like, what were they thinking? Like, because I don't believe that those officers thought that segregation was good policy. Um, I'm not saying that there were no black people that ever thought that there were some, but I don't think by 1964 that they thought that. So they clearly were participating in some level in an enforcement of a legal regime and a legal structure that they thought was not just wrong, but probably immoral. But I, I, I find that I find the picture always kind of haunting in a way. And then especially so as we think about, you know, what happened in, in, in Memphis with Mr. Nichols. There's a lot to unpack here. Through my conversation with Mr. Foreman and through the reading of his book, I came across a nuanced view, not only of the different issues analyzed in the book, from the war on drugs to gun regulation, but also a nuanced view of the role of black individuals working within a system designed to disempower them. First and foremost, the very first question I asked Foreman is, to me, an important one to ask ourselves before tackling this topic. It's really easy to be critical of uh, marginalized groups, people yeah. of color, uh, women. And um, when you talk about police brutality or, you know, or the racism in, in, in police institutions, um, targeting people of color, some people might say, that's not really the right way of going about it. You know, there's white mm. cops. Why are you criticizing black cops? Mm. Again, you know. It's so easy to criticize marginalized people. So um, did you think about that while writing the book? 
did you like how did you handle it yeah that's such a good such a good question i mean i thought about it really honestly every day that i was writing the book so you know i came to the project out of in a way the literature and the understanding that you're describing you know i i had become a public defender in the 1990s because i viewed it as the civil rights work of my generation i became a public defender because i thought that a mostly white american society was had created a set of laws and institutions that was very oppressive and harming many people but especially uh, a disempowered black minority that had suffered from hundreds of years of disenfranchisement and my parents had met in the civil rights movement my dad is black my mom is white and they were in a group called SNCC student nonviolent coordinating committee and their like their generation had done so much to change america but still as i was graduating graduating law school in the 90s i was seeing the in unfairness and injustice of the criminal justice or criminal legal system and to me it looked a lot like the segregation and other oppression that they had been fighting so that you know that kind of understanding that you're describing um is very much my own understanding and then i go into a world like washington dc where so many of the decision makers are black where i'm in front of black judges who are deciding what what to do with my clients who are also black but my clients have been arrested by black police officers the laws were passed by a black majority city council the mayor was black the chief prosecutor was black and the city was doing so many of the same things that the rest of the country was doing so to me the question then became how did this come to be right how did it come to be that even in a majority black jurisdiction with some control of its local courts and its local criminal policy we were making so many of the same choices that i believed then and still believe are are racist and oppressive right and so i was writing this book not to try to say that other story right the story of white supremacy is not important don't don't pay attention to that only thing that matters is black decision makers no when you write a book you're writing a book that's part of a conversation right so i always tell people before you read my book read the new jim crow by michelle alexander read just mercy by brian stevenson read between the world and me by tana hasi coats then read my book because though i because those books were all written before my book i had read those books they had influenced me so i view myself as part of a conversation with books like that and i just mentioned 3 but i could you know mention 10 or 15 more and so i don't view myself as telling like the only story right and so therefore i feel like it's then more appropriate to focus on these black decision makers because there is an assumption at least for me that the reader understands some of this larger conversation now to go back to basquiat and his contribution to the larger conversation we need to look at a bit of the history of black law enforcement you know the original story you know in reconstruction and after reconstruction so in the united states in the late 19th century early 20th century at a time of over racial oppression the idea that a black person right who is recently out of slavery would be empowered with a badge and a gun was unimaginable in large parts of the country right so black people were kept out of police forces black people were disenfranchised they weren't even allowed to have guns let alone have guns with the authority of the state and then as part of the early civil rights movement so 1930s 1940s right we think of the civil rights movement as the 1960s but of course people are fighting for civil rights throughout this these decades part of the argument for racial justice was an argument to have black police officers so the in my book i really focus on atlanta which is actually where i'm from and one of the parts of the us that has you know long had a substantial black population and a black middle class and black leadership and in atlanta the call was 
and they would march for this with 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 signs that said 100,000 Negroes deserve one Negro police. And Martin Luther King Sr., the father of the great civil rights leader Martin Luther King, he was what he spoke in favor of the civil rights demand of having one black officer. We need to have a black officer in this community. That was that was the claim that they were making. One of the things that people tend to not understand, but it's really important, is that from the beginning, there have been differences of opinion about what difference black officers would make. So some people wanted black officers because they actually thought that they would be more vigorous in uh, addressing crime in black communities. It's hard to think about now, but you know, 100 years ago, one of the claims was that crime in black communities was ignored by the white power structure because they didn't care what went on in those black communities. Other people thought that black officers would be less brutal towards black suspects, right? Black, that's, that's kind of what we think of today maybe as, as the most common rationale. Other people thought, and there was a class element to this, but there were members of the black middle class in Atlanta in particular that wanted black police officers because they thought that black officers would be able to distinguish between elements of the black community. For white officers, all black people look the same. But a black officer would be able to tell the difference between a pastor or a teacher or a doctor who deserve respect and maybe somebody who is out there breaking the law. And then the final argument for black officers was just that these are jobs and people need a chance to have a good job, right? Whether they'll make a difference in the job or not, it's a job and people should have a chance to have that job in the same way that they deserve a chance to have a job as a, a steel worker or a, or a firefighter, right? We don't demand that black people, we don't say, well, you have to be better at fighting fires, that that's a rationale for having the right to have that job. It's just the right to have a job that everyone else could have. So what I would say now, as we sit here, you know, a hundred years after those first struggles, is we are really living with the legacy of never being clear or never being unanimous about what difference black officers were supposed to make. So then people are always surprised when we see stories and it looks like the black officers didn't make any difference. They did the same thing that a white officer might have done in that situation. And people say, well, how could that be? And must I remind you that in his book, Foreman goes into a lot more detail, especially about the history of black policemen, how they were discriminated against within their own police department, how in many states they weren't allowed to arrest white people, how promotions were not only difficult, but in some cases completely impossible. He goes into some of the reasons why black people became police officers and how some black officers were also extremely racist. So, what is the irony of black policemen? Why did this young black artist in New York City in the 1980s saw irony in the fact that some cops are black men? I mean, different people are going to have, you know, different ironies. And um, I don't think, you know, for myself, I could never say like exactly what is the irony that a particular artist had in mind at a particular moment. But I can say that a common irony that people would have felt at that time was that by the 1980s in New York, that one black officer that I talked about Martin Luther King asking for in the 1940s had now grown to a point where there were significant numbers of black officers, especially in big cities throughout the US. So in some cities like Atlanta, and DC, black officers would actually be become a majority of the police force by the by later in the 1980s. In other cities like Memphis and Detroit, it would take a little bit longer, but they would also become majorities. And in a city like New York, black officers were never a majority, but they were a sig significant number. And you also had black people, not just as rank and file officers, but in leadership positions. So you have a black police chief in New York by the late 1980s. And the irony is, or one irony is, that even with the increase in those numbers in that representation, the police are still behaving the same way. The police in the 1980s in New York are beginning to adopt 
a more kind of aggressive approach. Some of the early things that later then would become known as the stop and frisk regime um, start to take effect. Um, and so one irony from the standpoint of a black citizen, right, especially somebody who's maybe living a little bit at the margins that is more likely to be subject to heavy police surveillance, is the idea that I now have a black face, but I'm still being mistreated. Um, and there's another irony, I think, that is from within the policeman himself, because mostly so far we've been talking about what it feels like for a citizen or what it feels like for a community. But one of the other stories that's really important here is how hard it is for black police, particularly in districts where, like New York, where they're not a majority. Because what happens, especially in those early days, in the late 60s, 70s, early 80s, when we start to see black police officers arrive, is they come into these jobs, but they're surrounded by a racist structure. They're surrounded by white superiors that don't want them there. They're surrounded by a set of tactics that demand that they go out uh, and really um, mistreat, in a lot of ways, black citizens. And some of them are okay with that, but some of them are not. And some of them are resentful. And some of them just want to keep their job. So they end up doing things that, in a way, I don't want, you know, torture themselves. Like they end up doing things that they don't, aren't happy about doing, but they do them. And one thing we know about human nature is you put somebody in a situation where they don't want to do something. The first time it creates anxiety, the second time it's a little less, and after a little while they're just doing it. And they've forgotten that they ever originally thought it was a bad thing to do. Um, so for me, that's another irony. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, uh, well, I'll watch the video and find out what your take is um, <laughs> on, the, on the irony. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, it's 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 interesting. Like the way the way I saw it is uh, as well is, and maybe you can comment on that. Mm. Is the, the irony of uh, a black uh, a black man working within a a white supremacist structure, mm -hmm. a, a black man reinforcing that structure, and and you know through through force. Mm -hmm. And there, there, there's an irony. Well, I feel like there, there might be an irony there. I don't know if you can, if you can comment on that. The, 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 the idea that of, of, um, of a black person, uh, reinforcing white supremacy in a way. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, I think I feel like that definitely pieces of the sort of ironies that I was talking about definitely connect to that. But that's kind of another maybe frame or another kind of tw lens on it. And I think it's a, it's an important one. Um, I think, you know, for me, the idea there um, that would have been ironic to a lot of people is that the police are, have such a history of racism and racial oppression in the United States. So the government generally has a history of racism. The society has a history of racism. But at the end of the day, somebody, right, has to enforce that. W at a very like basic level, right? So you take land from people, right? You make them sharecroppers. And when they protest and they demand better wages or access to land, or they say my land was stolen, as black citizens have done for hundreds of years, somebody has to come in with the baton and enforce the racist law. Right. Same thing in more in 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 Jim Crow, in segregation. You know, my my parents, my you know, like I mentioned, my dad's black. He marched for uh, against segregation throughout the South. And there were times where he was arrested by the police. And sometimes those officers were black. Right. So here you have the most obvious example. Right. Of a racist structure you quite literally have the police enforcing a law that imposes segregation, that says that black people cannot eat at this restaurant. The police are the embodiment of a legal system that is unjust. And for a black person to take on that mantle, 
right? In some ways, I think you could call it ironic. But if I think you could flip it as well and say, it's not really ironic, it's the logical outcome. That is to say, it's the logical outcome if you're the kind of person like me who believes that systems and structures and institutions are ultimately more powerful than individuals. That doesn't mean that individuals don't matter. It does not mean that individuals don't have agency. We do. But it does mean that those systems and structures and logics are on aggregate going to be more powerful. And so then what that would say is it in a way it's not it's not ironic but rather it's to be expected that a black person would eventually take up this role in an american in american society and this last point made by james foreman jr is to me the strongest takeaway from this painting how the image of a black cop is the best embodiment of the systemic critique of the police criticism of individual officers the infamous bad apples analogy doesn't help in identifying and therefore fixing the broader problems faced by the black community in regards to police brutality and mass incarceration. If the problem wasn't systemic, if it was only a few racist white officers, then black officers should solve the problem at least substantially enough to see a difference. But what history has showed us and what is described in James Foreman Jr.'s book is that the introduction of black police officers didn't really help as one might have expected. The roots of the problem run deeper, they're systemic. The irony of black policemen as presented by Basquiat, or the irony of black policemen brutalizing black people, turns out to be nuanced and complex. This complexity, though it can be confusing to some, needs to be understood in a broader, equally complex system. To start or to continue demystifying this system and this nuance, I invite you to read James Foreman Jr.'s book. The full interview will be posted on my second channel, Germinal. We talk about him and his work a bit more, how his activist parents heavily influenced him, what he's currently working on, which is, by the way, both impressive and inspiring, and finally, he briefly talks about his upcoming book. Also, I'll be streaming after this video is published. We'll be talking about the video, about the book, there's a guest we'll be interviewing, so come hang out if that sounds fun to you. And as always, I'd like to thank Roman Brendel, Mike Wex, and every other patron for supporting the channel. If you also want to support the channel, check out patreon.com forward slash the canvas. Thank you.